Good morning, everyone. My name is Manuel Skelis, and I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about our work on trying to dissect the mechanism underlying human genetic variation associated with disease. So the power of human genetics and the promise of human genetics is that it can reveal genetic regions associated with disease, such as the FTO locus here associated with obesity, and reveal new disease mechanisms, new target genes, new therapeutics and personalized medicine. But the challenge, of course, is that when you open up the hood underneath these regions of association, you realize that in 93% of cases, these disease hits are in fact non-coding. They do not perturb the protein directly, which makes it difficult to understand what is the target gene? What is the causal variant? What is the cell type of action? What are the relevant pathways? And what are the mechanisms? To understand these loci, what we need is the circuitry rather than just, hey, here's a region of association with the disease. We need to understand specifically what are the genetic variants? What are the enhancers that they sit within? What cell types are these enhancers active in? Who are the upstream regulators that control these enhancers? What are the motifs that are disrupted by these motifs, by these SNPs? And then what are the target genes that ultimately exert the function of this genetic variation. To systematically understand this, ENCODE, Roadmap of Genomics, and many other consortia have basically sought to systematically profile diverse tissues and cells across multiple stages of development in many different regions of the brain, and carry out a diverse of epigenomic assays, including DNA accessibility, DNA methylation, and histone modifications, to recognize the combinations of these epigenomic marks that define distinct states of chromatin. These include enhancer chromatin states in orange, promoters in red, transcribed in green, and repressed in gray. So we can now systematically map these states in every one of hundreds of epigenomes to systematically understand the dynamics of chromatin what we can do is reveal modules of enhancers that are coordinately active across these tissues, and then use these modules to predict what are the regulators and the motifs associated with each of these modules, which allows us to go back in each region of association and figure out the circuitry, enabling us to now start linking together non-coding loci associated with disease, in this particular case, schizophrenia, with the target genes the cell type for the act and the mechanism of action. We can systematically look at the enrichment between the genetic variants associated with diverse traits and the tissues where these enhancers are active in order to recognize and predict the tissue of action for each of the cell types. We can use this to infer a prior for every annotation which allows us to go back into regions of association and infer what are the annotations that are more likely to be functional and therefore what are the SNPs that are more likely to be driving these associations. Using this, we can in fact validate uh, genetic variants associated with schizophrenia are indeed localizing specifically in the central nervous system enhancers and genetic variants associated with Crohn's disease are localizing in immune enhancers. We can also use epigenomic information to prioritize sub-threshold loci that do not reach genome-wide significance, but have the same epigenomic associations or genome as genome-wide significant loci, enabling us to prioritize additional regions of association. We can combine all this information with genetic variation across individuals to look at how are the molecular phenotypes changing with respect to disease and start predicting these intermediate phenotypes as a way to infer the path of causality to disease by looking at the association between imputed molecular phenotypes and ultimately disease in a causal mediation framework. Ultimately, what we wanna do is go back to these regions of association and infer what are the relevant tissues and cell types, what are the target genes, what are the causal nucleotides, who are the upstream regulators, what are the cellular phenotypes and what are the organismal phenotypes? And we've carried out this in the FTO locus that I showed you earlier to basically go from a region of association to a complete circuitry of association where we know the upstream regulator, we know the SNP that is responsible for the association, we know the downstream target genes, 
and ultimately the cellular and the organismal processes that result from this. This, re this was a beautiful collaboration with Melina Klaus and Sherman and many other people. But the reason why we care about this circuitry is that we can now start manipulating the circuitry to reverse the disease phenotypes. We can actually start uh, <clears throat> increasing or decreasing the expression of the upstream regulator or the downstream target genes. And we can even use CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to change the causal variant from C to T and T to C. And in each case, what we find is quite striking. We can shift back and forth between lean and obese phenotypes. Here's one example where changing just one SNP out of 3.2 billion SNPs in the human genome, we can in fact restore thermogenesis and the burning of calories for the risk individuals and go bring them back to the physiologically normal levels. And if we downregulate IRX3, one of the two genes that is upregulated, what we find is that mice lose a lot of their body weight, their fat stores are completely depleted, and when you put them on a high fat diet, they're unable to gain weight, indicating that we, can, we have successfully understood the circuitry of this disease. To help many scientists do that systematically, we've basically generated multiple resources, including Haploreg and Epimap, that allows you to go and enter your GWAS of, of interest and then find all of the SNPs in LD and all of the annotations and the target links for all of those. So explore these links, you'll gain a lot out of it. But in addition to these bulk tissue epigenomic annotations, we can also start dissecting the circuitry of human disease at the single cell level. What we've systematically done is looked at 1,400 post-mortem brain samples across a dozen different disorders and 5 million plus cells, including Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, and multiple other disorders. We can now start looking at every single dot as a cell and how are the expression patterns of all of these cells capturing the, her the heterogeneity of these cell types as individuals progress from non-Alzheimer's to early Alzheimer's to late Alzheimer's disease. And what we find is that every major cell type shows dramatic differences in cellular states. And those cellular states that are associated with disease are in fact enriched for female individuals, providing insights into the pathology. And indeed, we found that oligodendrocytes, for example, are differentially activated between men and women, specifically for myelination pathways. And indeed, women show a lot more white matter loss than men. We also looked at the burden of somatic mutations in the genes that are expressed in each of the cell types by leveraging the single cell RNA sequencing aspect by looking at the somatic mutation for smart C and then tagging what are the genes and pathways that show an abundance of these somatic alterations. We've also used the single cell RNA-seq data to capture spatial information about the substructures and the subregions of the hippocampus, for example. What we see is that the clustering of the cells from the hippocampal structure is in fact revealing multiple subclusters corresponding to different domains of this subiculum CA1, CA2, 3, 4, and the dentate gyrus. And indeed, these are differentially associated with Alzheimer's, where CA1 appears to be the most pronounced with Alzheimer's disease, followed by these other subregions. We can now use the single cell data to start going back to the genome-wide association loci and try to figure out what are the target genes that are differentially expressed in disease in these regions, and what are the cell types where these are expressed taking schizophrenia and the uh, recent genome-wide association study, we can basically look at the single cell dissection of 800,000 cells and then start partitioning these cells uh, into all of these different types of more than 20 different subtypes of cells and then start asking what are the differentially expressed genes in each of those loci? Are they positively or negatively associated with schizophrenia, providing us a uh, handle for targeting these genes therapeutically. These analyses also reveal some very interesting insights. For example, this SZTR, the Schizophrenia Transcriptional Resilience 
cell type appears to be found in individuals that are schizophrenic in their phenotypes. But if you look at their transcriptional profiles and you predict pathology, for all of the other individuals, you see this beautiful correlation between high pathology predicted and indeed high pathology. But for the SCTR containing uh, individuals, for those individuals who show those cells, you see that the other cells show transcriptional profiles that are much closer to normal, suggesting a form of transcriptional resilience. We've also been able to use this to understand who are the upstream regulators of those differentially expressed genes and what are the pathways in which they fall and what are the pathways they control. And what we're finding is that indeed synaptic signaling, synaptic organization and early neuronal development are the three major classes but if you look at the regulators, we actually find a lot of pleiotropy where there's a set of five regulators that are themselves genome-wide associated with schizophrenia that are in fact driving two different developmental programs, one in early embryo development and one in late uh, adult uh, tissues where both upregulated and downregulated genes in this SZTR cell type appear to be acting both early and late in development. Using single cells, we can also go back to the DNA accessibility information and start relating the transcriptional information with the epigenomic information. Here's some examples where you see genes changing in disease, in their expression, and also changing in their single cell accessibility for each of the cell types that we are now showing in pseudobulk. We can also look at coordinated changes between different cell types and between different genes both in transcription and in um, accessibility and look for genes that are um, coordinated. We can also do the same analysis that I had shown you earlier for epigenomic enrichments at the tissue level, but now do this at the single cell level for each of the cell types. And what we're finding is that psychiatric disorders show the strongest enrichments for uh, accessible sites that are accessible in excitatory and inhibitory neurons such as schizophrenia here, whereas Alzheimer's only shows an enrichment for microglia uh, consistent with an immune basis for Alzheimer's disease, specifically in the microglial immune cells. And again, if you look at other immune disorders, you see enrichment in microglia, but if you look at a lot of non-brain disorders, you don't see any enrichment. And indeed, we can start localizing a large number of these GWAS loci, specifically in enhancers that are accessible specifically in microglial cells, and we can infer master regulators of those cells, such as SPI1, whose motif is disrupted in multiple locations. <clears throat> we can also start subdividing these microglial cells and actually capturing more than 10 different subtypes, and in particular, I want to focus on synaptic microglia versus inflammatory microglia, because what we're finding is that inflammatory microglia show accessibility specifically for AD, but not for schizophrenia, and conversely, synaptic microglia, so accessibility for schizophrenia GWAS, but not for AD. And similarly, the differentially expressed genes in those cells are uh, AD and SC specific. Lastly, uh, we are systematically testing these predictions. Every time we predict the circuitry of these loci, we can actually go in and carry out these massively parallel reporter assays using uh, technology that was co-developed with Tarja Mikkelsen to start perturbing specifically the motifs or the SNPs associated with these loci and testing 10,000 constructs at a time. We've also developed these uh, ultra high throughput uh, assays for testing 7 million elements simultaneously by capturing them directly from heterozygous individuals and then inserting them into self-transcribing constructs that are then able to capture in high resolution specifically where are these disease variants acting. We've also started constructing these modular and programmable CRISPR uh, assays that allow us to now start testing these loci uh, by editing knockout activation or repression, differentiating them from iPSCs into multiple different types of cells, and then specifically testing what are the impacts of these mutations. And then in collaboration with Andreas Penick, we're now transfecting those constructs into the brains of mice to look at their 
cellular interactions in a multicellular context. And we have several collaborations underway with Li Hui Tai, Miriam Heyman, uh, Kristen Brennan, and Andreas Fenn. So to summarize, we start with human disease genetics to reveal common and rare variants and regions associated with disease. Then we profile RNA and the epigenome systematically in both healthy and disease samples. We integrate all these data computationally to predict driver genes, regions, and cell types. And lastly, we validate our predictions in human cells and in mouse models, and we disseminate the results. I'll stop there, and I'll be delighted to take any questions. Thank you.